So when we're thinking, when we're talking about country ministry, this is this is big, prosperous, strong country town ministry that, that you've been in. Uh, for how yeah. long, mate? Oh, okay, we've been here 23 years now. I came to Dubbo straight from um, Bible College. Okay, okay. Now uh, you've been working the Presbyterian system. Why, yeah. why Dubbo? Why, like, how did you end up there? Did you deliberately choose there for strategic and thought-out reasons, or um, what was it? Yeah, yeah. Well, we did. We, um, when we were going through more college, uh, Sue and I both wanted to go somewhere after college that, at that time, was more difficult for, in all honesty, Sydney Anglicans to get to. Uh, we were interested in getting to areas of New South Wales where, for a whole range of reasons, it was more difficult uh, for um, strong Bible teaching to get into and which hadn't really had a legacy of strong Bible teaching like perhaps you might say Sydney had. Um, okay. And so, right. yep. yeah, so the way the Prezi system works is that towards the end of your training you get a list of places that put in for a, what they call an exit appointment yep. and uh, for a long time Sue and I had been thinking oh, I'd be lovely to go to a place like Dubbo because we thought it's strategic gives us not just Dubbo itself but a more of a regional influence as well um, and by the grace of God when um, the list came out in my final year Dubbo was on it for a range of reasons and so we put our hand up to come here Okay, excellent. Now, when you started there, um, in terms of church planting, Dubbo wasn't it wasn't a um, like a startup from scratch. Uh, a, a little church in Dubbo twenty three years ago. Yeah, yeah. D Dubbo had had a checkered history, so it had gone through some bad uh, a bad period, and it became what was called at the time a project charge, which meant that for it had it had a, it had a, it, had, a, it had, had issues. And so um, rather than the, the little church that was here of about 20 people being able to invite a minister, the denomination decided in its wisdom, hang on, we're going to actually appoint a minister there. Okay, so you started with about 20 people um, 23 years later, mate. How many, um, uh, I know you're always reluctant to talk numbers, but how many people have you got in Dubbo um, and how many congregations roughly? Just kind of broad brush. Broad brush, we, we now operate on five, a network of five churches and um, probably all up if on a, on, a, on a Sunday and a Tuesday we'd have something in order of three to 400 people. Okay, fantastic, process. fantastic. That's, that's great, the great, great kindness of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, in terms of this, this uh, webinar uh, and country ministry, is there a particular kind of man that uh, you need to go and work in the country? Do you need to be able to drive a tractor or uh, own a rifle or something? Well, it probably doesn't hurt, but um, our, our experience was, like I'd never lived in the country before, and so uh, we both, Sue and I, had grown up on the Central Coast. So it was a bit of an unknown, and to be perfectly honest, coming, coming to Dubbo, is I know Dubbo's got a Dubbo sort of reputation, but in many ways it's it's not a big difference to metropolitan ministry because it, it is such a regional centre. So right. it's a little bit embarrassing for me talking about planning in the country because in some ways Dubbo is not real country um, in terms of uh, yeah people's mentalities and thinking. Not yeah, not it's a big it's a big centre. I mean, when you live where I live in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Kind of, uh, you know, everywhere's the country. Um, but yes, that's what true. about is there when you you known guys who've worked in, worked in smaller centres? You get towns yeah, uh, five, four, three thousand. Are there particular oh, four, aspects yeah, of ministry five, there? Five, four, three hundred. Yes, actually, you're right. Five, four, three hundred. Are there particular aspects of ministry there that you know you need? Is it does a bloke need particular patience to work in a little town? Um, uh, is that the you know you need to you live with your mistakes for a very long time in a in a little town? Absolutely, and the mistakes are very public, um, and yeah. everyone will know about it. Even coming to a place like Dubbo, one of the things that we that we were surprised at was the lack of anonymity. Um, you one of the great strengths of being in the country is that you'll bump into fake in your church family just walking down the street, which really 
rarely happens in Sydney. Um, yep. So you will bump into people all the time um, at school, at sporting events, at social events in the town, and so there's a real there's a real lack of anonymity, which has its challenges, but also has its great benefits as well. So, for example, in the first week that I was here in Dubbo. Um, I can't even remember how I got into the conversation, but I ended up having a conversation with someone down the street who was telling me about the new guy who'd come to Dubbo to the Presbyterian Church and how um, he was telling me all about me, obviously not knowing that I was the guy. Now, this person was, was not a member of the church at that time. He wasn't one of the 20 people who were there. But yet, somehow, word even went around a place the size of Dubbo so that here I am down the street and, and some complete strangers telling me about me. Okay. Now the beauty of that, the, the, that, that can be uh, kind of hard and a big thing to live with, but by the time you've grown a large, a large church in a, in a smaller town, you can really be noticed as well, won't you? So people would be well aware of Dubbo Presbyterian um, in the town. We would think so, and yet surprisingly, we still are, are, are often bumping up against people who are unaware of our presence, or um, who don't. Who I think we're always being surprised at how small a profile we actually have, and yet we do quite big community events, carols by twilight, um, uh, before Christmas, where we actually have fireworks displays, and police are at actually. Um, directing traffic because it's now so popular that there's traffic jams outside the building of people with drive-bys and, and stuff like that. And yet we're continually bumping into people who um, weren't quite sure that we existed and where we are. So, right. yeah, it's funny. We're surprisingly, yep. always surprising ourselves at what at our lack of profile. Okay. Now, are there particular... Are there particular dangers or difficulties in terms of long-term ministry um, in a country context, even in a large country town? Things that uh, things that you've noticed compared to your, um, you know, your soft city mates. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, see, we came to Dubbo with an attitude that we wanted to be here um, minimum ten years because we were convicted that the country often um, suffers from people going to a church in the country and then, um, you know, after the obligatory three or four years, they progressively move back to closer and closer to, to Sydney or the coast. So yep. we wanted to resist that. Um, and I think that's paid dividends in the sense that people have, country people are wary of blow-ins who just come and go. And, you know, and so if you want to change something, people often can they'll they'll just consider oh, I'll outlast you. You'll be gone in three years, and then we'll go back to what we were always doing. And so there's been benefits in being here long term. The downside is that you do pick up pastoral collateral damage, um, just from stances you've made on things, um, uh, difficult conversations you've had to be you've had to have with people. Um, that doesn't go away in a country town because it's what I found is that difficult people stay with you longer, if that, it, it, yeah. in the sense that antagonists, there's not really a lot of other churches in town for them to go to, so they're not likely to just drive next to the to the Anglican or the Prezi Church in the suburb next door and start going there. Uh, so your antagonists, in my experience, have, uh, and maybe I've just had particularly um, persistent ones, but they've. They seem to have stayed much longer than I than I was expecting. Yep. So you live with your good relationships longer, and you um, you live with, with your difficult, difficult relationships longer. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, to that end, I reckon um, I've seen guys in the country who may be single guys. I reckon it's a t it's a very tough gig for anyone who's single. Um, uh, you really need a a, a, a solid Quality marriage relationship that's working together in ministry because it's a it's a I think it's a more isolating experience than than being in metropolitan or coastal areas. Right. Yeah. More. I was going to ask you about uh, particular family pressures that you felt. So for a single man, it's easy to you know would feel more isolated. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. It's probably not impossible, but they've got to work really hard. I mean, I just in our region, I've 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 seen single guys come and go and been burnt out quite badly, and now aren't, aren't even in the industry. Right. Right. Yep. Okay. Now, have you um uh one more quick thing? Have, have you found useful networks in terms of keeping in touch across the state? You know, you haven't got a lot of guys really close. Have you have you made an effort or found things useful in terms of just keeping in touch? Yeah, look, from day one almost when we when I left college, uh, a group of us routinely got together once a year uh, and we would critique each other's sermons and we'd talk about the year in review and what things we've tried and what things haven't worked and what things have worked. And we'd basically just pool ideas and have, you know, two or three days away together just sharpening yep. one another up and that that was absolutely invaluable for uh, okay. the first 10 15 years right now we're going to um, uh, we're going to uh, move to questions now um, okay. so I think what you've said though is um, be prepared to stay long term uh, well, I, I think so make yeah. a difference. yep um, okay and uh, driving a tractor or using a rifle doesn't hurt Okay. Well, yeah, well, especially in the smaller towns. And sorry, but we were just chatting about that the other day uh, with a couple of other ministers in the region, and we've even been brainstorming about, particularly in smaller towns, actually coming to a smaller town with a mindset of tent making ministry and actually getting a part time job for a couple of days within the town gives you. It actually does give you a lot of street cred within the town, and you're not just a, a minister coming in yeah. and. Going out yeah, I think that's right. If you're able to do something that's useful, that does make yeah. a difference. Exactly. Uh, let me take let's uh, take some questions here. Uh, John asks, how do you connect with smaller communities to gain their respect? Now that's pretty much what we were on then, wasn't it? How do you yeah. connect with smaller communities? So, have you got any specifics about that, or you know anyone who's done that in terms of this tent making thing? Yeah, there's a guy who is he's in the Prezi system, but there's a guy who's effectively pick, uh, deliberately started a, a part-time job where he sort of uh, helps maintain air conditioners and stuff like that um, for the specific purpose of, of strengthening connections within within the town and they're really quite small towns that he's trying seeking to minister in and he's thinking that that's making quite a difference in um, the way people are responding to him and uh, uh, um, yep. building bridges yeah yeah, I suppose one of the other things is that sometimes the smaller towns will struggle to support a minister full time. And yeah, uh, well that, yeah, exactly. Learning, yep, yep. Uh, another question: What have you? Um, uh, now here we have another question from Matt. What criteria would you use to determine if a church should be planted in a town? Say a little country town or something. What criteria? How would you work out whether or not you should? Uh, Plant a church into a particular town. Uh, well, I guess um, at the criteria that we applied, rightly or wrongly, was the strategic value of it in terms of what's the potential growth there. That sounds a little bit mercenary, but in the end, you, you, we wanted to strive for a potential a church that would be potentially self-sufficient. Because when we came here, the church was not self-sufficient. And we needed to have um, uh, help from outside the actual church to for, for me to be able to here, be here full time. So I'd be looking at the at the at the potential of of the town. Um, I'd be looking at the core group at, and the relationships that exist within that. Uh, mind you, if I'd sort of known that more fully than I did here, probably would have never come to Dubbo. <laughs> To and in fact, people I can hear you, mate. Just you say, I'm sorry, you might not want to say that sentence too much louder, but yeah, keep going. Uh, in fact, people warned us not to come to Dubbo, that um, right, ch right. chew us up and, uh, and spit us out. Um, in the end, they're the sort of criteria, and obviously the man, the, 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 the team, the husband and wife team themselves, uh, more than anything, they've got to be people who I think uh, have good networks already in place that will sustain them. Um, in the yeah, you've got to be uh, 
pretty dedicated and know that you really want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Another the, whole Geneva, mentioned... the whole Geneva push thing um, is just genius in terms of sifting that through that sort of material. Now, obviously, it didn't exist when we came here, yeah. but but it's it is exactly what's needed to ascertain the whole issue of the value of planning in the country. Excellent. Uh, by the way, folks, that was an unsolicited comment, but we have recorded it. Um, <laughs> now, uh, James wants to ask, uh, Bryson, what led to your decision to plant a night church off-site? Um, what do you think are the advantages of a multi-site approach in a regional centre? Well, the, the, re, the rationale behind our um, wanting to do that is firstly, well, there's a range of reasons, I guess. We wanted to um, have a church that was targeting a particular demographic in town that we thought was um, uh, needed to hear the gospel. And in particular, a demographic, we, it was young adults, a particular demographic that was being targeted by, in all honesty, more um, other part, uh, other churches in town in an unhelpful way, we thought. So we actually deliberately wanted to plan a church that targeted a, a, a demographic of young adults. We then mm. started to think, okay, what's going to be effective in doing that? And we thought an off-site venue um, for a, a demographic that in many ways is unchurched um, would be desirable. So we looked around for a venue that might be um, disarming and inviting, and so we were able to get one in, a, in the cultural centre here in Dubbo, a room in the cultural centre. So in many yep. ways, it, the decision to go off-site um, was generated from the particular target group that we were aiming for within the church plan. Right, so you, you build your structures around the people you're chasing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. I've uh, got, uh, got another one here from, um, uh, let me see, from Dave. Bryson, uh, what did you do to overcome the, quote, this is our church mentality in the 20 people who were there when you arrived? Um, I'm sure that was a difficult time for everyone involved. Um, are there particular lessons you learned about how to love and deal with those 20 people? Um, yes, yeah. It, it was a difficult time. Um, and I guess all you can do is keep hammering uh, the point that is that you just got to keep reaffirming that it's actually not our church. Um, it's actually Christ Church. And uh, we want to build a church where we don't know everyone because that's a church that's way too small and that's dishonouring to Jesus and we, we actually want to grow the kingdom. So in many ways it was we uh, it was a strategy of just, going, just um, tackling that approach head on as an approach that really doesn't do justice to who Jesus is and what God's agenda for the world is. Um, and, and it just took time um, and in some cases a long time, years and years for um, people So to for young guys, Bryson, could I get you to just speak up just a little bit, mate? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, better. yeah. Oh, that's better. Um, so for young guys, young couples who are thinking about doing this, those first few years can be very tough. How long was it till you actually uh, turned the corner? You felt that people had kind of come on board and you know, the, the church generally was kind of, you know, on the mission. Oh, well, in one sense, that's an ongoing strategy that we're always trying to improve. Um, I, I think a turning point for us, uh, well, there's a couple of things that stick in my mind. It, it, very early on, one of the things that sticks in my mind is the very first uh, uh, evangelistic meeting that we had on a Sunday where I invited people to become Christians. That was... That was mind blowing for some people there, um, and I got a little bit of flack about oh gee that was a bit of high pressure type stuff. Um, even though all I did was invite people to talk to me after the meeting if they wanted to become a Christian, but just the whole idea of inviting people to become Christians and follow Jesus um, 
that was a big moment, I think, in the little group of people in in just a paradigm shift, hopefully yes. for some of them, about what was what we're actually on about. Because it um, says so, some people aren't Christians already. Exactly, yes. Mm. And yeah. even just to use the language of inviting people to um, make the decision to follow Jesus Christ as opposed to just encouraging people to come to church. There was a, I don't know, that for some reason, just that simple event, um, and that was quite early on, uh, that seemed to send a signal that I thought was caused some ruffles but was helpful um, in, in doing okay. that. Uh, the okay, other, uh, another big stepping point for us, I think, was when for the f when we had our first, when the team ministry went to the next stage of it being um, not just me but having someone else come on team. So what happened is that after a couple of years, a young fellow called Shirley, who is just a terrific guy, he went off to more college and uh, after three years we were able to get him back. Um, now getting Paul back after, that was I would have been here four years, that was a major battle in to some extent in the... Why do we need to yeah, and some of the guys who were in leadership, still in leadership roles, like in the elders, who were, who I was having um, uh, disagreements with over the direction of the church and things like that. And so suddenly um, getting a second person and building a team ministry had the effect of broadening, broadening the horizons of some people but for antagonists, I think it also had the effect of thinking, "Oh no, when this is this is now going to go on for a long time because even with Bry if we see Bryson off, there's now another guy here." Yes, so yeah. there's now two of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for some reason, um, uh, that early just simply having inviting people to become Christians, yep, and then later on the building of a team ministry. Um, yep. That, yep. That would, that yeah. would define That's still, I'm going to interrupt you now, mate, and ask you a question. That's still four years on. I want to ask you a question. We have two questions about men's ministry. Um, mm -hmm. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'll read this one exactly as it is. I'm not sure that I agree with the premise, but here it is. How do you engage with a conservative and sometimes, uh, quote, passive aggressive style of country people, especially men? Um, like I say, I'm not. I, I'm from the country. I don't necessarily agree with the premise. And the next question is, do you think getting the men is more important in the country? So you might want to just comment about uh, your approach to men's ministry, I guess, um, uh, in Dubbo or in country towns. Well, certainly getting men is is important. I don't know that it's more important. I, I think there's a stereotype for country churches that, that, they're, that there aren't any men there and they're full of ladies who make lemmingtons and stuff like that. So I, I, I realise that there's probably a bit of a stereotype um, about country churches to that extent. Uh, and certainly to, to some extent um, in the smaller country towns, they are more dominated. There, there's not a lot of guys in them. So men ministry is important. I actually think what we were chatting about before, especially in smaller country towns, of the, the ministry worker actually um, working even part-time in another job, that gives a certain cred to, to other guys. I don't know that country men have been... I wouldn't, know, wouldn't say that they're any more passive-aggressive than, than metropolitan city people. I, I think one of the things you've got to get through with country people is that oh, my experience is that country people have a much stronger God awareness, but it's making that next step of moving past the God awareness to actually getting specific about Jesus that things can get a bit threatening and people aren't used to. Um, yes, yes. So the, the closer you are to the land, the more obvious it is that there's a creator. Now, that's yes, a little I, segue... Into a one, I think we've got time for one last one. This is, um, uh, I'll just read the question. James asks, um, I've heard there are many indigenous people in Dubbo. Um, uh, do you try to outreach with them? Um, if so, how? Have you been able to make kind of progress in that area, mate? No, look, honestly, we haven't. Um, 
for a whole range for for a range of reasons. Um, the, we've had uh, indigenous faiths join the church, and for whatever reasons, they've always struggled. There, there's been issues of um, sometimes um, indigenous brothers and sisters not not hearing what we what we think we're trying to say and even just issues of body language and styles of relating has just made it difficult. I think the key to quality indigenous um, ministry is is getting a quality indigenous worker um, and yes. building it around them. Uh, we've we've really struggled it at um, at that at that ministry and it's often the topic that comes up and thinking through how we can do better and if we can do better. Yeah, it does come down to finding the right, uh, the right leadership, the right gospel workers. Uh, well, Bryson, that's uh, that's about all we have time for, mate. We've uh, okay. yep. our, uh, our time is winding up. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to hear about what's happening out at Dubbo, and uh, I'm going to hand back to Mark Hadley, uh, who's the brains of the operation, and he'll finish up the day. Thanks very much, guys, and uh, particularly thanks, Bryson, from uh, all of us at the Geneva Push and Al for managing it so well. And I'd also like to thank everybody who's been sending their questions in. Guys, I've got to say I've never had to deal with such a flood of questions before, so if yours didn't get answered, please uh, accept our apologies. We'll try and pass them on to Bryson and see if he has any notes we might be able to put down for those particular ones. In particular, there were some regional centre questions and all sorts of things that are probably well worth considering. Now, before we finish up this webinar, I need to draw to, draw to your attention a couple of events that are coming up that you might actually be very interested in. Uh, in Melbourne on April 18, so it's actually next week, we have church planting and failure. It's a bit of a taboo topic, you know, it, particularly in this area of ministry. How do you talk about those church plants that just don't work? Or, or how do you know yours is not going to work? Uh, what, sort of, what sort of failures are necessary failures? What sort of failures are unavoidable? And do you sort of risk failure? How do you go about doing that? Well, Mikey Lynch and Peter Leslie will be talking about that in Melbourne on April 18th. So if you are in the greater state of Victoria, I'd really make an effort to be there. Uh, if you can't, we will be trying to put the audio up for that in a couple of weeks after the event, but it's well worth being there always so you can get the face to face. I'd also like to point you towards our next um, our next webinar, which is uh, on May 9th, only a couple of weeks away. And this one is with Rick Smith and Mikey Lynch. It might actually be Mikey, might be out, we're not quite sure yet. But uh, Rick Smith will be speaking with us on leading the platform. So when you come to a, uh, a church plant and you're trying to plant from out of a congregation, are you necessarily the guy? And this might be one particularly for people who are already ministering in, in leadership positions. Are you the guy? Do you support somebody else to be the guy? How do you help those people who are the guy, so to speak, and the team that's going to go ahead? So I really look forward to that at 9.30 a.m. on May 9. Registration will be opening on our site later today. So I'll be sending you an email at the end of this so that that way you know that uh, you'll have a link through to coming events and you won't miss anything that's sort of coming up. Finally, we'd just like to thank the guys at the AE Insurance for making the entire thing possible. Again, it's very hard to take care of a lot of these uh, particular legal requirements and things like that if you're planning a church and really your chief gifting is as an evangelist or uh, as an administrator. Sometimes covering things like insurance can be just a bit of a headache. So we would thoroughly like to recommend you get in touch with EA Insurance. These guys are specialists in church planting insurance. If you go to ea.org.au, they'll help you. They may even be able to talk to you about things you haven't even considered yet, which you need to cover. So EA Insurance, well worth the effort on that part. Now, finally, you're going to receive a survey right at the end of this, uh, and it's basically going to ask you to help us improve this event. So if you've uh, got an idea as you come along, if you'd like to have it longer or shorter, they're very, four very short questions that will help us uh, develop these webinars so they're more and more useful for you. Once again, please take time to do that. Thank you very much for participating. For the 35 people who have been in the room, in and out today, we'd like to thank you for your participation, your why we're here, and we hope that we can do everything under God to help you plant more churches across Australia. Goodbye. <laughs>